Blog Talk Radio. Well, here we go, ladies and gentlemen, across the country. I always get excited on Tuesdays. I mean, there's a lot of shows, but, man, I'll tell you, Tuesday, I kind of call it the Rust Belt Report. You know, you started out with Cleveland, and then you got Pittsburgh right after. I sit back, listen to this great show, and the one after this, and, man, I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Yours truly, Mark Mancini, producing it. Welcome to the American Sports History Podcast, hosted by my good friend, brother, mentor, Peter Ray. Move over the Cavaliers, move the Browns out of the way for the time being. They'll bounce back and, you know, balance their books here on Sunday. But right now we come front center stage with this great show, 347-205-9631. You can catch the archive on blogtalkradio.com forward slash Mancini Sports Podcast Platforms, wherever you subscribe to, powered by Mancini Media. So as I lay the red carpet down, Put the podium in its place and hand off the mic. First of all, Peter, how are you? Second of all, how can people get a hold of you? And third of all, another great legend comes through your show tonight. Hi, Mark. I'm doing well. I'm, I'm on Facebook, uh, Peter Peter Ray R E A. I have a YouTube channel, Peter J Ray R E A. And you're uh, and you're all you're absolutely right about tonight's guest. You know, uh, my favorite people I think are authors of books and uh, specifically uh, including sports books. And today's uh, today's guest uh, came out with a book last year, and I'm sure it's going to be one of the greatest sports books of all time. He's got these. Uh, he's got. Um, uh, uh, recommendations he he went to authors jeff perlman jonathan ike i eric malinowski jonathan abrams how we count all uh have written promotions for this book and it's about my favorite era in nba history from 1975 to 1989 the title of the book is from hang time to prime time and it's very, it's a real honor and privilege to have on the show tonight mr pete croato Peter, thanks for having me on. That, and thanks for the introduction. I'll try and live up to that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Pete, uh, can you uh, give us a, a general overview of your book? Well, the book pretty much covers uh, the NBA's rise um, into a cultural and um, business behemoth um, from 1975 to 1989, uh, before the NBA really took off as sort of this, um, for lack of a better word, um, uh, conglomerate, it really kind of came from humble beginnings. And the book traces how the NBA uh, became the NBA uh, in all caps. So, yeah, uh, covers uh, those 14 years, which I think uh, really cover the game's explosion in terms of style of play, in terms of uh, uh, its um, its growth as an entertainment and business property. Uh, and also it, it covers how the NBA really embraced what it was, that it wasn't going to be like baseball or, or the NFL and just sort of follow the same old, uh, the same old game plan. They were going to try to uh, um, make their product for kids, younger adults, and the casual fan. And, and the book really breaks down uh, all the things um, that made that possible. You know, the uh, I'm sure you've had uh, – just looking at that time period, you know, the uh, w- there's a lot of talk about – you know, there's been a lot of talk – tremendous amount of talk about Michael Jordan and uh, mm-hmm. now LeBron James. But, uh, you know, back in – to me, it was a, such a cool time when you had the ABA there for a while and then the merger. And Julius mm-hmm. Irving, uh, to me, he seems kind of a forgotten player, but Jer- Julius Irving really should be remembered because uh, one of the most entertaining basketball players of all, and greatest of all time. You want to talk about Dr. J. Julius Irving? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I, I think it, as – one of the um, one of the unfortunate side effects of, of history is that um, the pioneers uh, get forgotten uh, all too easily, especially now in a sports landscape where, you know, if it happened yesterday, it's already too late. So, so Julius Irving to me um, is one of the most important figures in NBA history uh, because he was because not not just for a style of play, which was which was remarkable. He was somebody who even now. If you look, if you go onto YouTube and scour, um, scour Google for highlights, the highlights are still breathtaking. He he he's a he's an art, he's an aerial artist. But what was most important about Julius Irving was that he really was the NBA's first marketable superstar. 
He was somebody that the NBA could turn to, uh, David Stern, the, the guys at NBA Entertainment, and use them, I'm sorry, use him as someone to be, to be their spokesperson, to be their ambassador uh, for the NBA. Um, because Julius Irving was, you know, was just really, was just a, a, a boy, was just a childhood hero come to life. He was eloquent. He was elegant. He, he talked to everybody. He always said the right thing. And he was somebody that parents could point out to and say, hey, you know what, uh, be like Julius Irving. He's somebody who is just a fine citizen. And the NBA didn't really have anybody like that, um, you know, in, in their early history. And, and so Julius Irving really fit that bill. He was somebody who was not like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or Moses Malone, both great players, but they didn't have his charisma. He did, he didn't, they didn't have his appeal as a, as a, a visual presence. And so Julius Irving really was important from, from, from a marketing and entertainment standpoint for the NBA. You know, they came out with some years ago a movie called Semi Pro, and, um, mm-hmm. and it, to me, it was a takeoff on the ABA. And the thing, again, you have the ABA is kind of a forgotten story. And um, the uh, the thing is, the ABA really seemed had a, I think, a dramatic effect because they had a, they seemed to have a better idea that this is all about entertainment, you know, and adding the mm-hmm. three point line. And then, of course, right. they had the red, white, and blue ball, and you know, er, and then the slam dunk. Uh, and so, do you want to talk about the ABA's influence on the NBA? Well, it was. I mean, you 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 just made reference to it. I, I think you know a lot of the a lot of the things that people enjoy now. Uh, in an NBA game, the three pointers, uh, the wide open style of play, that was th- those are ABA staples. As was the whole concept of entertainment, um, you know, or, or the game as entertainment. The ABA really started with that because there's no other choice. I mean, they were, playing, you know, they had to get they had to get people to the arena to see their games. But I think what the ABA did that maybe gets forgotten is that aside from introducing Julius Irving to the mix, the ABA introduced a collection of young, high-flying, explosive talent. Because if you look back in 1976, the NBA didn't really have those kinds of players. It didn't really have players that were um, flashy or, uh, you know, or, or were skywalkers. But, you know, here comes the ABA in 1976. If the ABA, the ABA by, by getting folded in, in the NBA, brings – Julius Irving, it brings uh, it, it brings uh, David Thompson, George Gervin, these play, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, James Silas, Bobby Jones, Dan Nissel, players that were just fun to watch and were all about offense, and who grew, and who played in a league that was wide open and didn't really rely on post play. It was all about either pulling up for a three or taking it to the rack. So the ABA, so the ABA's biggest influence on the NBA was the style of play, I think, because it brought in all this legion of young talent who not only made the game enjoyable, but they were great players. I think half of the All-NBA team in 1977 was comprised of ABA players. So that really that was the benefit of the ABA was that it, it, it shaped how the game was played, but it also shaped the kind of player that was popular and that was effective on an NBA court. Uh, welcome, Mark Heffernan is listening. Barry from Shaker Heights, Ohio, wants would like you to talk about Jim Jones, one of my favorite players for the, in the history of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Oh my God, <laughs> Jim Jones! Wow, I mean that is you know it's funny. I don't, I don't, I tried reaching out to Jim for the for the book. I interviewed about uh, more than three hundred people for this book. Uh, Jim wasn't uh, what was wasn't part wasn't part of that uh, that group, alas. But what I love about about Jim Jones is that. I think he's a throwback to a certain kind of player that you don't see anymore, which are basically these, you know, bruising, these bruising physical get the job done players that I loved watching as a kid. And in my day, it was guys like Charles Oakley and, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, Bill Cartwright, you know, these sort of these lunch pail guys, Larry Smith, that, that were just, you know, you kind of liked having around and, you know, it's with, 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 with a with a player like Jim Jones, like that those kind of players are gone now, and it got, it kind of just speaks to the evolution of the, of the NBA, where you don't really where where a player that was a that was an that was an invaluable piece, um, you know, 25 years ago, 
is really would have a hard time cracking cracking rotation now. But yeah, I, I love players like that. I, I love players that are just you know that look like you that look like an angry stepfather and just can can hoop. So I, I love players like that. I have I have a soft spot for any player that 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 um that has that old school flavor. Um, yeah, but he yeah he had the he he was unfor- he had he was unfortunate enough to play for some pretty um to play what before Cleveland was a, was a marquee franchise. So yeah. You know, one of my favorite uh, people in the history of the NBA is Bill Walton as a player, mm-hmm. as a as an announcer, great, wonderful personality, really funny, outgoing. And, and the mm-hmm. 1977 Portland Trailblazers won the NBA title, and that, to mm-hmm. me, that, that will always stand out in my mind. Do you want to talk about the 1977 Portland Trailblazers? Well, I think this is an interesting that, – that, that team is interesting for a couple of reasons, because – First, I think it's just it's one of those great teams that had a, a wonderful one year run that probably could have been a dynasty if things had had if things had worked out better. Um, you know, if, if Walton's feet hold up, if um, you know, if Walton's feet hold up and team keeps plugging along, I mean, they could probably win two or three more championships. I think they were they were that good of a team and they had that kind of chemistry. Um, but it's also interesting because it really is sort of the first. It's the first post. ABA merger finals, and that finals really is interesting because it captures sort of these two con- two contrast con- contrasting styles. You have the Sixers, which are this sort of which are made up of, of players like Doug Collins, George McGinnis, an, another ABA um, refugee, uh, Julius Irving, uh, uh, who else? World be free, like all these runners and gunners, this open style of play, and meanwhile. The, the Waltman Blazers, from my understanding, are really a team that's based on the half-court set. They're based on fundamentals, on doing things the quote-unquote right way. So really that finals is sort of a – is sort of a uh, – is really sort of maybe the, uh, a good, a good um, snapshot of the ABA of, – I'm sorry, of the NBA of what, of what the NBA was and what it would become. Um, but, yeah, those, those ABA – those – that, that Poland team is just really special because I think there's just – there are a number of teams that, that win one championship, but are forever caught in the imagination. The 85 Chicago Bears are, are a team like that. The 86 Mets are another team. And I think you can put the 77 Blazers right right, right, right alongside those, those teams. Uh, welcome, Daniel from Spokane, Washington. Uh, now, we've got uh, Mark Mancini has, throw, has thrown out five names for you. You can comment on any, of, any one of them. Spencer Haywood, <laughs> Bobby Dandridge, Maurice Lucas, Carl Malone, and Bobby Jones. Oh, man. I'll go with Bobby Dandridge or Bob Dandridge. I think Bob Dandridge is. Um, I will tell you one thing. I talked to Bob Dandridge for the book. He was a really nice guy, and I'm just thrilled that he's in the Hall of Fame or that he made the Hall of Fame because I think he he was somebody who was just the ultimate glue guy on two NBA championships, championship teams, the '78 Bullets and um, and '71 Bucks, and he was never really a quote unquote star, but he's some but he was somebody who always made his teams better, and it's also He's also, uh, you know, a player that kind of, you know, came from obscurity, getting drafted, I think, out of Norfolk State in 69. Yeah, I think it was a fourth-round draft pick. He was really low in the draft and just became a star. And it's just – it's one of those great NBA stories of, of a player kind of coming from nowhere to becoming a key contributor um, uh, on a team. And he's also – I think he's also, he's also the person on that list who I spoke to for the book. So I have a, I have a soft spot for Bobby D for, for that, for that reason. Uh, one of my favorite people in NBA history is Lenny Wilkins, who played for Cleveland, yes. was a coach with Cleveland and won a title as the coach for the 79 supersonics. And uh, I have to just say, I have a soft spot in my heart for Seattle basketball fans who don't have that team, who lost the team, won the title, lost mm-hmm. the team. And and in, in, in Wilkins' biography, he said, you know, when we won the title, he said, nobody ever talks about what happens after winning a championship. And he said he said that the champagne wasn't even flat before they started having trouble. <laughs> oh, <laughs> do yeah. Talk, do you want to talk about Lenny Wilkins and the 1975 NBA champion Seattle Supersonics? <laughs> I'll, I'll try. Um, you know, I think – you're right. That's a team that really should that really should have been powerful or, or better for longer. And you know, you had Jack Sigma. You had um, I'm trying to think who else was on that team. Gus Williams, Freddie Brown, great great backcourt. I don't think it's talked about enough. 
Um, you know, Gus Blade is probably one of the better, one of the best defensive guards of the of the seventies. Um, you have Lonnie Shelton. Uh, was John Henry Johnson's on that team? Great. I mean, just just a great team. But it's so funny. I, you know, chemistry and not being consumed by things outside uh, outside of winning of winning games. It's so hard to maintain. And you see you saw you see that a lot in, in sports history. There's just getting getting winning a championship is so hard. But getting there is even harder. And that's that's that's. That Sonic team is a perfect example of that. Like, I also think they kind of came, they kind of came around, or they kind of came, they kind of maybe peaked too soon, because right, because you know that year, seventy nine eighty magic comes along, and the Lakers start their run of dominance for the next decade. So yeah, I mean it was just it was just a, a, a bad a bad set of circumstances. But that's a team that I just think is, I, I really enjoy, I really enjoy that team. And you know again, it's 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 also a sign that back in the day. When that, when that, you know, that when that, when that team, when when those finals were on, I think they were pretty low rated because Washington wasn't exactly a powerhouse. Seattle kind of snuck in, and you know, and 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 you know, but now you know, I don't think we worry about that so much, you know, because it's just the NBA is so popular that I don't necessarily think you need a Los Angeles and a New York to face off or a Chicago and a Dallas to face off. You can have two cities that aren't exactly big markets and. People will will watch the games and people will um, will talk about it. I mean, look at um, look at Milwaukee and Phoenix this past year. Uh, welcome, Jay from Independence, Missouri. Uh, do you have any thoughts on Otis Bird's song? <laughs> Otis Bird's song. I, I, you know what's funny about Otis, Otis Bird's song is that he is. If you look back at his stats, they're nuts. Like he averaged like over twenty points a bunch of seasons. I think he was a four time All Star, and it's. It just shows you how rich the, the the 70s and 80s were for NBA talent. That you know, you mentioned we mentioned just now um, uh, Bobby Dandridge and Bobby Jones and or Maurice Lucas and and now Otis Birdsong. These guys are legitimately great players, and you're not going to really hear you don't really hear much about them anymore. I think Otis Birdsong is I don't know what he's doing now, but I think he was a coach. These guys get kind of lost in the shuffle, and, and and that's the cool thing about this book is I hope this book brings gets people talking about not only the stars of the day that may have gotten forgotten, that may have been forgotten about, but I think, but what this book also does is it shows the forgotten people uh, who may help make the NBA great, whether it's Don Sterling and NBA, um, I'm sorry, Don Sterling and NBA entertainment or Larry O'Brien, the NBA commission for David Stern, or even, even somebody like, um, you know, like Bill Marsh who helped, who helped make NBA apparel uh, relevant. So yeah, I mean, the NBA history is full of these forgotten gems and, Otis Birdsong, uh, you know, is a great Kansas City King and New Jersey Net is one of them. Of course, uh, when you get into the 80s, oh, uh, Trevor from Sugarland, Texas, welcome, welcome to the show. Uh, would you like to? Uh, our guest is the author is Pete Corrado, author, author of this amazing book um, about the NBA from, from NBA from 1975 to 1989, from hang time to prime time. Any thoughts on uh, the Ice Man, George Gervin? I will tell you a funny George Gervin story. George Gervin was one of my was one of my most favorite player interviews for this book. And George Gervin, I was initially rebuffed by him, by his, by one of his handlers, and then a gentleman from uh, formerly of Nike named Mark Tomashow, uh was able to get me was able to get me uh, George Gervin's um, uh, email address. So I emailed George Gervin and. He, I gave him my cell phone number, and within five minutes, he called me. He called me back, and he was on his lawnmower mowing his lawn, and he talked to me for forty minutes, and it was awesome. Uh, I, I lo- George Gervin is just is, you know, there are people. It's funny when 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 you, I think for anybody who's a sports writer, there are you have these occasionally these pinch me moments, even though you're, even though you're supposed to be impartial and, um, and you know, um, just just you know, stone faced. But talking to George Gervin and having him talk to me about playing with Dr. J when they when they were when they were at the Virginia Squires and and having him talk about you know Alex English, um, you know though, while you know while and hearing him and that great laugh of his that cackle, um, it really was just uh, you know that was reason enough to write this book. So I do have a part of me. I have a very I have a soft spot for George Gervin. 
You know, the uh, I guess nobody ever gets tired of uh, talking about the eight 1980s in terms of uh, Larry Bird versus uh, Magic Johnson and the Boston Celtics versus the mm-hmm. Los Angeles Lakers. Would you like to talk about uh, those two fellows and that that personal rivalry and team rivalry, which seemed to really uh, jumpstart the NBA into a, a, a much, much greater popularity nationally and internationally. Yeah, you know, it, it, you know, so much has been written about and discussed about those two as competitors and as players. And and the book, my book, really looks at these, at these men in terms of what they what they did to the popularity of the game, just from, just from, a the just from an entertainment standpoint. Like, I think what gets lost in the shuffle is that, was that they were pre that Bird and Magic were prepackaged as rivals from the very beginning, and it was perfect because. You had this. You had this built-in audience from the 1979 NCAA Finals, which was the most watched basketball game of all time. You have Magic is black, Bird's white. You have them going to opposite coasts, not only opposite coasts, but the two, but arguably the two most storied franch, NBA franchises in the Lakers and the Celtics. And the fact that they were so good so soon gave CBS, it gave the NBA a narrative they could pitch their wagon upon. So it, it really be it really those those finals that they played in those those finals in, in eighty four, eighty five, and then eighty seven really were almost like a summer drama that viewers could hook onto. Instead of watching Dallas or the Deuce of Hazard on CBS, you could watch Bird and Magic go at it. And you know, it, it, as Brent Musburger told me, it forced you to choose the side. You were either you, if you were for Larry, you rooted for, you rooted for the Celtics. If you rooted for the Lakers, you 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 were you were you rooted for Magic. But aside from that, from the from the TV ready packaging that those gentlemen provided, what what they did was they made fundamentals fun. They made fundamentals sexy. You know, Pat Riley once once observed that Magic Johnson was the most fundamentally sound player he ever he he ever coached. So you have these two players that are not that are not only flashy and they're they're perfect for the for, for the new fan to identify with, but you also have basketball players that play a game in a way that would make, you know, maybe your father stand up or your grandfather, you know, notice. So the value of, the, of, the, of, of Bird and Magic in propelling the NBA's popularity is that, and, and it, go, it, it goes beyond them just being two wonderful players. It, they, set, they set a mythology that persists to this day. Yeah, Trevor from Sugarland, Texas says your book is amazing. Uh, the oh. and now that you've got a recommendation from Sports Illustrated, the book has plenty of hoops anecdotes, but what makes it shine is the stuff adjacent to the game. Would you like to talk about the stuff adjacent to the game? Yeah, absolutely. And that and to me, that's what this book that's what this book is all about. Look, I mean, your your listeners uh, will read will will I'm sure have read a lot of sports books and will read a lot of sports books. Uh, I'm among them. I'm someone who devours them. I'm reading a book about the 1993 women's tennis uh, 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 tour right now. Uh, <laughs> that's that's how deep I go. Um, I hate reading books that tell me things I already know. I want to read a book about things that I don't know. I want to know the backroom stories. I want to know the anecdotes from the people who were there who maybe weren't the stars. I want to know about – I want to know – I want to know the deep and dirty stuff. And what this book does is that it, tell, it, it doesn't just give you recap, you know, oh, the Lakers played the Celtics in game, in game seven of the 84 finals. That's been done to death. What this book tells you is it tells you how the NBA became the, arguably the second, the second biggest sport in the world. And it does so with just, with just colorful anecdotes and with people that you can identify with who not, who not only love the game of basketball but care about it, and that's what this book does. This book just gets you inside, inside the, the the arguably I think the biggest one of the biggest stories of the past you know fifty years, the rise of the NBA of a global institution. It's it, it's for people that just like that like social history. It's for people like business books, but it's for people who like a good story and who and who want to know more about why why they fell in love with their favorite game. The um, 
I, my son was telling me yesterday that Russell Bre- Russell Westbrook is the new Dennis Rodman. Now you've you've <laughs> got the 1989 Pistons, right? That's will come at the end of your book, and the Bad mm-hmm. Boys. Uh, the Cleveland Cleveland Cavaliers were contenders, but uh, the Pistons were better. And and of course that was. Uh, do you want to? That that was another a very memorable team. You want to talk about the? Well, I think it was the 89-90 Pistons won two titles in a row. Yeah, the the eighty nine yeah the eighty nine ninety Pistons were um, yeah I I, I love that team um, just from because I think it's sort of the last um, the last gasp of you know of a, of kind of bully ball of like you know grown men ball so to speak but really what's important about the Pistons is that and I grew up with this I grew up with the bad boy Pistons I grew up you know with you know them being sort of the, the heavy of the NBA the bad guys of the NBA. And that was by design. You know, NBA Entertainment and the Pistons sort of worked hand in hand to cultivate this image of, you know, just of these guys that just took no prisoners and, you know, were just were out for blood. And it worked because if, if you, because, you know, because again, as, as Don Sterling, um, the head of NBA Entertainment, told me, every story needs a villain. And the Pistons were the NBA's villain. And it got a whole bunch of kids and adults interested in, in the NBA because, you know, we, everyone loves the black, black cat. I mean, look at the Raiders. They've been playing that role for 50 years. So the Pistons were just not only a great team to watch and, and an exciting team with Isaiah Thomas and Joe Dumars, but they also were a team that, that were part of the NBA's marketing uh, genius because they saw an opportunity to make these guys into the league heavy and run with it. And they did for about three or four years, you know, uh, it was it was something that that worked that was very effective, and to this day we're still talking about the bad boys. Now you've uh, put a lot into this book, and I'm sure you've uh, I've been trying to think of good questions, but I'm sure there are some things, some stories uh, that come to mind that maybe might be favorites for you, and uh, I can't I can't think of a specific question to elicit an answer. But anything that uh, anything else that comes from the book that. Uh, you'd like to talk about some story or some anecdote that, that you thought was that's, that, that yeah. comes to mind right now? Yeah, I'm happy to. I mean, the one thing that I thought was – the one thing that will always amaze me, um, not amaze me so much, but just kind of convinces me that people are good in this world, is that one of the first people that I reached out to for the, for the book was uh, Larry O'Brien III, which is Larry, uh, that's Larry O'Brien's son. Uh, Larry O'Brien was the former commissioner of the NBA. Um, he was, uh, you know, a member of JFK's Irish Mafia. He was, you know, part of uh, LBJ's cabinet. He was, he was a politician and a, a veteran politician, but the NBA's first real deal commissioner. And I wanted to know more about him because I felt that the I felt that this book couldn't be written without some some something about Larry O'Brien and his role in the NBA's ascension. So. I reached out to Larry, to, to Larry, uh, Larry, Larry Jr., and he wrote back to me, and we began corresponding. And Larry, you know, also sent me some documents and some D- and a DVD about his dad's life, and he he was great. And we were talking, and he said, you know, my dad wrote an oral history about his time at the NBA. If you want to come over to to DC and take a look at it, um, you know, we, we can arrange. I can arrange that for you. So I drove down with my my wife and our then I think 18 month old daughter um, from Ithaca to DC, which is about a five and a half hour car trip, which is l- much longer when you're with a toddler who keeps throwing up. And I went to uh, Larry Larry O'Brien Jr.'s office in DC, and for two days, I went through the type the type manuscript of Larry O'Brien's time in the NBA, and it was amazing to go through that to see these things that hadn't that hadn't been published that no one else had seen and it was you know with the, with the handwritten comments in the margin and it was one of those moments that convinced me that that people people really want to help and people if they talk about something they care about um you know will will help you and if you're genuine about it they'll help you and and really this book is about those people it's about the 300 plus people who Many of whom worked for the NBA. They worked for teams who wanted to have, who wanted to share their story about the NBA when it was and what and what it beca- and what it became. So really, this book is about those people and it's about their stories. And 
it was my privilege to, to tell them and to, and to get them out there. And I hope uh, I hope your listeners can in, can enjoy them. Uh, the the book is From Hang Time to Prime Time by Pete Croato, 2020. And this, I would say, yeah, uh, uh, someone, my, I was 15 years old in 1975, so I was you know, really mm-hmm. getting into And so this, that time period would, for guys like my age, you know, that's this is our youth when we were young. And then, of course, for young people, this is good history. And uh, it's always one. And there are young people getting into history, sports history. So our time has flown by. Uh, uh, Mr. Pete Croato, do you have any final words for our audience? Uh, yes, I do. And thanks for having me on, Peter. This is great. Uh, if you want to buy, if you want to buy the book, it's available at all major retailers, brick and mortar, and online. So BarnesandNoble.com, Amazon, what have you. Uh, if you buy a copy of the book, uh, feel, you can find me on social media uh, at Twitter. Um, I'm at Pete Croato, P-E-T-E-C-R-O-A, two T's as in Thomas O. If you buy the book, I'm happy to send you a signed book plate. Uh, If you want to buy an autographed copy, you can do so by going to odysseybookstore.com. That's O-D-Y-S-S-E-Y bookstore.com. And it's a great indie bookstore in Ithaca, New York. Uh, They can arrange an autographed copy to be sent to you. So, yeah, uh, that's that's my uh, little sales spiel, and I hope you enjoy the book and, and get something out of it. I have not read the book. I just heard about the book, but it's certainly something that I would would like to read, and it it just looks just tremendous because, like I said, it's uh, it's my it's my youth, so uh, it's something that really appeals to yeah older guys. But again, yeah, it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful if you're into sports. It's it's wonderful to get into the history of it, and you don't have to. And I'm sure you've done that here. So just absolutely tremendous. I give you all the credit in the world for writing this book. Uh, from Hang Time to Prime Time, Mr. Pete Croato. Thanks for having me, Peter. Appreciate it. Yes, okay, very good, wonderful, tremendous, amazing. Uh, uh, n- n- next week, our guest will be Skip Hall. He has written a book. Uh, don't have information about it, that, but Nick Saban wrote the foreword, and so that will be next week. Dear listener, may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Good night, everybody. Thanks again, Mr. Mr. Pete Croato.